SCG Church. My name is Autumn, and we're so glad you're here. If it's your first time at SCG, welcome. Please stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby to learn what we're all about and get to know some of our friendly staff and volunteers. We have a lot going on at SCG Church that we want you to know about. First, our Youth Summer Bash is coming up, and it's all-American themed. We have so many fun things planned for our junior hires and high schoolers. There's going to be inflatable games and activities, a photo booth, food, and so much more. Check out our website to learn more or to get your freedom passes to secure your spot for food. Next, get ready to party because VBS is back. Jesus gives us the most amazing reason to party, and that party starts June 24th, so you need to get your kids signed up soon. It takes a crazy amount of work and effort to bring this amazing week of VBS to our kids, but it is only possible with your help. No matter what your gifts, talents, and interests are, we need you. So scan the QR code or visit our website to get your kids signed up or to become a volunteer. Speaking of volunteers, Royal Family Kids Camp is coming up. This is a camp where we bring kids from the foster care system to have a fun week at camp and experience the love of God. But we still have lots of roles to fill to make this year's camp happen. There are lots of ways to help and we'd love to have you join us. Scan the QR code on the screen or visit our table at the courtyard to sign up or learn more. And don't forget to bring back your loose change jars. Next, mark your calendars for our Kids Move Up weekend. This will be the weekend your kiddo moves up to their next grade for the 24-25 academic year. We know how scary and exciting this can be, so we want to make sure that we are making this weekend as fun and special as possible for you and your children. So join us on the weekend of June 8th and 9th for fun games, worship, and small mementos. All of these events are on our website, but you could also visit the tables in our courtyard to learn more. We want to say thank you for generously supporting the work that God is doing here at SCG. You can give online or in person at the black offering boxes on your way out. If you are interested in discovering ways that you can serve others here at SCG, we'd love to have you join one of our volunteer teams. Scan the QR code on the screen to help us get you plugged into the right spot. And if you need prayer, head on over to our prayer and care corner in the lobby. We care about what God is doing in your life and we'll be ready to pray for you. There's always a lot going on here at SCG that you can be a part of. So stay up to date on the latest events by checking out all the tables on the courtyard, following us on our social media pages, and visiting us on our website at scgchurch.org. Well, hello, SCG family. We're so glad that you're here. Can you stand on up as we praise the Lord together? Let's clap our hands. Come on. Here we go. We serve a God who's greater and bigger than anything. Let's worship together on it. See, I march into battle, no doubt in my mind that my God is with me and victory is mine. So I dance in the shadows of my enemies because God is my champion and he fights for me.
God is over every problem and every situation. So we can step confidently into every season of our life. So if you agree with that, can you say I'm not afraid this morning? Come on. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Tell every giant. Tell every giant. Get out my way. Get out my way. Tell I'm not afraid.
reminds us of what it means to live life as a conqueror. In Philippians 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. 17 says this, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. If I could just shrink that into this one little phrase, if you want to keep the devil under your feet, you have to keep your eyes up on Jesus. Yeah who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So as we go deeper in worship, I just remind you to fix your eyes on the one person who can change everything. Can we worship together? Let's worship together. See, I've been told to just live my own truth and do whatever makes me feel good. Get rid of boundaries that rules are stifling and chase good feelings that soon will be gone. But I found myself more lost than ever, slaved and bound to my desire. No, that's not freedom. Can we say, Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus every day? More like Jesus. Crucify my flesh with yours. My new life might be secure. Everything I do, done so I can honor you. Resurrect me, sanctify me. Make us look more like you. Yeah. You feel a change coming. Say, I feel a change coming. More of you, more of you, and less of me. Transformation by your spirit in me. Oh, now that I know you, I know there's no one. I know there's no one. You're the one that my soul loves. Now I find myself more alive than ever. My life laid down for your desire. Now this is real. So we say, Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. Every day I live more like Jesus. Crucify my flesh with yours. up it says praise be to God praise be to God that you saved me from myself praise be to God praise be to God there's a new life I've been dealt so I never look back no I can't go back I'm yours no. oh I never look back no I can't go back I'm yours if that's your prayer can you lift it up this morning say praise be to God that you saved me, me and you raised me, me, so praise be to God. God. There's a new life, so we never live.
make us over, make us new. Can we lift this up? Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. Every day I'm living more like Jesus. Crucify my flesh with you. My new life, my feet. Everything I do, done so I can honor you.
we're thankful that your goodness never got tired, that it chased us down, it ran after us and caught us in so many different places. We're thankful that you are a God that never, that your love never fails and it never gives up. We thank you for that posture towards us. In this moment, we surrender our time and our attention to you because we recognize that if you chased us down, you have something for us. And we are open and ready to receive it here in this place and watching online. We thank you for loving us the way that you do have your way in this place. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And can someone just shout amen? amen. Oh, if his love chased you down, say amen. You may be seated. We have one really important announcement that we want you to know about Royal Family. We want you to turn your attentions to the screen and check it out. I've heard about Royal Family Kids Camp through a friend who was talking about how wonderful it was just unplugging and being able to uh, work with the kids and in essence be a kid again for a week and just uh, be a part of their lives and give back to the foster kids in general. My daughter actually was a counselor a long time ago so I knew what it was all about but I just didn't feel like it was the right time for me and figured I'd consider it more once I wasn't working anymore so I retired and then I went to Royal Family Kids Camp. <laughs> uh, I had a friend uh, who kind of asked me about it and encouraged me to sign up and really um, kept reminding me about how they needed volunteers and I was like you know what why don't I just go sign up take an interview kind of see what it was about they welcomed me in and I, I volunteered last year. The first the first time that I tried to get involved um, it didn't work out it was you know tough to schedule a whole week off and then last year, I decided just to book it in my calendar. So I, I have extra vacation time, so just go after it and, and commit, and then just see what God has in store for me. Last year was my first year, and I worked in recreation. I think just preparing myself to understand the kids' needs, and um, there's always a different way to serve, even if I'm not doing a recreational activity, which is what my assigned job was. I was working in some other area, because it takes a lot of volunteers to make this happen. Having three kids of my own, and seeing these kids who have been through a lot, and then the stories that they shared with us, they were fairly emotional um, and it was a little bit hard to hear the kids talking about things that, that they'd been through. Knowing that I had a part to play in their lives of, of introducing something good to them was one thing that uh, really uh, I, I took away from it. I could, I could really tell that the week impacted them a lot. Like they came in, they were a little shy, right? They were closed off. Um, but by the end of the week, they were like high energy. They wanted our attention. So I could see that they really picked up on how the counselors, the staff were very intentional with their time and caring and loving and just really patient with them. And they picked up on that and they just opened themselves up. I walked from the bus with one girl who, she was really quiet, didn't really, you know, I tried to like kind of joke around with her and loosen her up a little bit. She didn't want it on day one, but throughout the week it was awesome to see how, you know, she kind of came out of her shell, she learned to trust, and um, she smiled, which like every time she smiled it was awesome. I remember my co-counselor and I, we had, I think we had like six kids in total. Um, and then one kid came in, and then we were like, oh, this kid is just gonna be off the walls. He's gonna be, quote unquote, maybe like tough, right? But then like when he noticed that we were just with him like all the time and we did things that he wanted to do, he started to like, before bedtime, he would he would be like, hey, can you read me a bedtime story? And then he would really want us to read him one before we went and had like a, like a break at night. Um, so I thought that was really cute. It's, it's hard to put in words the feeling that you get by seeing these kids being able to relax for sometimes the first time in a long time, being able to be in their own space and know that this camp is there for them and knowing that you played a part in giving them possibly one of the most special moments of their life. I feel like for a lot of them, it was just a week where they felt like they could be a kid and just have fun. Anyone that was is hesitant to volunteer, uh, first pray about it, 
God will make a way in your schedule. Uh, that uh, That's the hardest part for me is just finding a piece in my schedule to go through the time. Um, but at the end of it is just commit. Um, any of it, any of life's choices are, are about committing and showing up. I would say just do it and chances are the kids are going to love you a lot. You might, you might struggle through certain things because it's not all easy, but you'll definitely, that will be a week that you'll always remember. It'll be worth it. All right. Well, um, if you haven't heard about Royal Family Kids Camp, it's been a ministry we partner with for, I think, over 30 years now. And if you are interested in being a volunteer, there is uh, some opportunities for that. But you got to do it today because next weekend they start all the training. So go out into the booth out in the uh, courtyard and you can talk to them. And if you can't, but you still want to support it, there are these jars that you can fill up with change. And then we always say, write a big check and put it on top so that you can financially support them, even if you can't go. Um, uh, so make sure, I, I think that they're still a little bit behind on some of their budget stuff and they still need some volunteers. So please uh, go and check that out. Now, today we are in our fourth week of a series called Cliff Notes. And so the basic idea of this series is no matter if you're a church person or not, you've ever you know, read the Bible or not, you probably have at least a little piece of the puzzle of the Bible. Like, you know some of the stories, you've heard them before, even if you haven't read them, but you're just not sure how the whole thing comes together. I mean, it's a pretty complicated. There's a lot that is in there. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to give you, here is how the whole puzzle comes together and creates this giant picture. And so we've been going week by week, kind of giving you the major points along the way. And this is going to be the last week of the Old Testament. And so if you see here, we've gone through the last few weeks and then um, we're, we're hopefully going to finish up today. So what I'm going to attempt to do is I am going to give you an overview of the entire Old Testament in just a couple minutes, okay? So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. Hopefully you're not too confused, but we'll see what happens. So um, the big picture of the Old Testament is that uh, and we, we've learned some things along the way uh, as we've gone through it. We've learned who we are and uh, what makes us valuable, what makes life worth living, and also what went wrong with the world. And we were introduced to the main character. And you're going to be surprised by this, but you're not it. You're not the main character. God is the main character of the Bible. And through this journey, we have found that uh, things have gone pretty badly for humanity. Uh, God set up this really great creation and we seem to mess it up. And so the whole Old Testament is doing this. And if I were to boil it down in one simple statement, it would be this. It is setting the stage for Jesus. That's what the entire thing, all the history that we're going to learn and all the people. If you fall asleep when I talk today, this is what I want you to remember. The Old Testament is setting up the arrival of Jesus. Because this is the creation and God is king and Jesus is going to arrive and he's going to be the king that reclaims his creation. And he's going to provide a way for you and I to be a part of it. So that's kind of the big picture. That's the purpose. Now, if you go back to the first week. We started in Genesis, and Genesis is really important. And there's some key words that we kind of took out so that we could understand what it was. So here are the key words. Place, people, purpose, problem, and promise. I'm a pastor, so I have to do P's in order to understand all those things, right? So uh, those are kind of the key things. So we started with uh, God creating a place where he rules and he reigns as king. This is his place. The heavens and the earth, everything that is created, it's his because he wanted to rule over his creation as king. And then he creates people. And people, it says, are made in his image. Meaning, we're different than the rest of creation. We are at the pinnacle. <laughs> I'm good at this. Pinnacle of creation. Because we can have a relationship with God. And he can have a relationship with us. And it makes us unique. It makes us special. And part of that is what gives us our intrinsic value and our worth. It's not based upon what we can do that makes us valuable. It's based on who we are. Also says that God made us male and female, meaning there's these two distinct yet equal pairs that come together as a whole, and we're designed for community. And so we have a place, we have people, but then we have our purpose. It says our purpose is, first and foremost, to love God. If God is love, and he wants to share that love, he creates people so that he can be in a relationship with them. And so he wants us to love him first. And then he says, and then I want you to love one another. And he gives us two other commands. He says, then I want you to go and I want you to rule over creation. So if you're going to be my representatives on earth, 
you're going to go and you're going to make sure that everything is taken care of and you're going to partner with me and be co-creators. I gave you these raw materials and I want you to create just like I have created. Unfortunately, there's a problem. The problem is that in order for love to exist, for us to love God, we have to have the ability to reject him. And that's what happens in chapter three of Genesis is that's what the whole forbidden fruit was about. It was us going, you know, I don't want you to be king. I want to be my own authority. I want to be in control. I don't trust that you have the best plans for me. I have the best plans for me. And so when we rebel against the king, this thing called sin enters into the world and the consequences of it is a separation from God. And we experience the consequences immediately. It says that Adam and Eve, they experience shame and guilt and regret And when they begin having children, Cain and Abel, we see this thing called death enter into the world because Cain ends up killing his brother, Abel. And so the world begins to spiral out of control as we rebel against God. But before this whole thing starts to take off, he makes a promise. He says to Adam and Eve, even though you've rebelled, and even though this thing called sin has entered into the world, I'm going to send someone a Messiah, a Savior, and he's going to begin to put the world back together. He's going to bring peace. He's going to overcome death and the consequences of sin. And he gives this very interesting imagery, if you remember. It was the imagery of the snake, because in the story, the snake is the root of evil, the representative of evil. And it says that this man is going to come and he's going to crush the head of the snake, meaning he's going to defeat evil. But as he does so, the snake is going to, is going to strike his heel and he will have to suffer as he defeats the snake. And this is a little bit of foreshadowing. This is a promise. And he's gonna make, God's going to make a series of promises throughout the Old Testament. He's going to elaborate and he's going to continue to talk about it. But this is the first one. He says, one day a Messiah will come, a Savior. Well, things begin to go downhill pretty fast. And man continues to rebel and sin continues to uh, ravage humanity. And God looks at all of creation and he goes, oh man, this is a mess. I mean, you guys have just messed this thing up royally. I mean, top to bottom, left to right, this thing is a disaster. Is there just one person, one human that still wants to be in a relationship with me, that still is righteous? And he looks and he finds one guy. His name is Noah. And he says, okay, you know what? I'm going to spare you and your family. And I'm going to have you build this giant ark. And you're going to get all the pairs of the animals on there. And then I'm just going to cleanse the earth of humanity's wickedness. And he does. 40 days and 40 nights, we see the waters come and they wipe everything out and it's kind of like a restart. The problem is that sin wasn't dealt with. And because sin wasn't dealt with and it still lived in Noah and his family very quickly after the flood, it just starts happening over and over again. They rebel, they do things they're not supposed to do and things start spinning out of control. And so by the end of this story, you realize humanity's a mess and they cannot fix it. Even if you give them a restart, they're just going to restart doing the same problems. And so the only way that this is going to be fixed is if this Messiah comes and provides a way to fix what's broken. One day, God speaks to a man named Abram, who later becomes Abraham. And we don't know why he spoke to him. We don't think there's anything special about him. He just chooses him and he goes, Abraham, guess what? It is your lucky day because I'm going to use you in order to begin to put the world back together. And then he makes him a series of promises. Here's what he says in Genesis 12. He says, uh, his name was Abram, later to became Abraham. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So he says, I want you to leave what you're comfortable with. I want you to leave your land. And I'm going to promise you a land where you can start a new life, a new life with me. And he continues. He says, and I will make you into a great nation. Now here's what you need to know. At this point, Abraham is about 75 years old and he doesn't have any kids. And so he hears this and he's thinking, you're going to make me into a great nation. I would just like to be a great grandfather at this point, but that doesn't seem to be happening. But God says, no, no, you trust me. I'm going to one day through you and your family, I'm going to make you into an entire nation of people and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. People are going to be talking about you. You're going to be famous throughout the world. People are going to be saying your name. In fact, we are. Here we are thousands of years later on the completely other side of the world. And his name has become great. And then he says, And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. Meaning this promise is unconditional. There's not going to be anyone who can stand in the way of me fulfilling this promise that I'm making to you and your family. And he finishes with, 
and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's going to be through what I do, through you and your family, that the entire world, a world that he doesn't even have a concept of how big it is and how many people they're talking about, but he says, it's going to be through you that I bless the entire world. Now notice what God's doing here. Is everything that was lost in the garden, God says, I'm going to begin to restore those things. So that you're going to have a new place. You're going to have a new people, a purpose, and I'm making you a promise. All the things that were lost, he begins to restore. He starts with the people. Abraham does have some children, Isaac and Ishmael. And if you know the story of Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac has a very difficult uh, uh, an event with his father. His father is called to go and take him to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him in order to prove that he is faithful and trusts God. And so he takes his son up there and he's about to plunge a knife into him and sacrifice him on the altar. And God goes, oh, time out. Hold on. Just, just want to make sure we're, you know, we're still good. I'm going to take care of the sacrifice. Don't you worry about it. But what was happening in that moment wasn't just a, a test of faith. It was foreshadowing that one day God would send his son and that he would have to sacrifice. But instead of stopping, he would continue to plunge the knife all the way through because he would be the sacrifice. And then Isaac has some children, Jacob and Esau, if you know them, they're twins, don't get along at all, end up going to war with one another. And Jacob has about, he has a bunch of kids, but he has specifically 12 boys and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And you probably know his most famous son. You know his name? Joseph, that's right, Joseph. He's like a fashion icon. Uh, Joseph ends up being pretty much his father's favorite. And his brothers are all jealous of him and all the fashion that he has and all the favor that he has in his father's eyes. And so they decide, you know what? We should just kill him. <laughs> you know, you think you've got family drama. We should just kill him. And then they have pity and they go, no, he's our brother. Let's sell him into slavery. That's better. And so they do. They sell him into slavery and he gets hauled off to Egypt. His father thinks he's dead and they think we're never going to see him again. And as he finds himself in Egypt, he goes from a slave because of God's favor all the way up to the number two ruler in Egypt. And wouldn't you know it, a famine hits the land and his brothers have to come to Egypt to beg for food. And who are they begging for food from? <laughs> Joseph. And they don't recognize him. It's been a long time. They thought he was dead. They weren't expecting him. And he goes, hey guys, guess what? <laughs> and this is a quinky dink. It's me, your brother, Joseph. You know, the one that you sold into slavery. But at the end of the story, here's what he says. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And again, we, we wouldn't have been able to see it at the time, but what was happening here was, Another foreshadowing is there would be a savior who would be betrayed and humiliated and unfairly punished, but it would all be because he was going to save many people, people who didn't deserve it. So Joseph and his family stay in Egypt because of the famine, and they end up staying there for long term. And it went well for them, but the coming generations decided to have more and more kids, just like they were promised. And they go from a family to an entire nation of people. The problem was they were a nation of people who were in slavery. Egypt quickly turned on them and said, there is too many of them. They're going to take over. We need to enslave this people group. And so they do. And so for the next 400 years, the Israelites now live in slavery in Egypt until God raises up a man named Moses. And he says, Moses, you're going to go and you're going to free my people. And so Moses marches in there and says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's not interested until God sends a series of plagues to convince him, probably for your best interest, if you will let these people go. And he does. He has second thoughts. He chases them. There's a splitting of the sea and they make it through and Egypt uh, gets, uh, get the, well, they drowned. Okay. And as they make it to the other side, they now are in the desert and they think, okay, God promised us a land. And we want to get back to that land. And so all we have to do is cut across the desert and get to the land that he has promised us. And it's not a very long distance. And so Moses is beginning to lead them there. The problem is they're a bunch of whiners. They look back and they go, you know, I, I know that we were in slavery for 400 years, but do you remember the buffet that we had? There was decent food out here. Not great. It's just, you know, I understand they took our women and our children and that was kind of a bummer, but we were well fed. And because of their disobedience and their lack of trust in God, God ends up 
sending him in circles for about 40 years, wandering the desert until he finally prepares them to enter into the promised land. The way that he does this is he says, look, if you're going to be my chosen people and you're going to represent me to the rest of the world, you're going to have to start living like it. And so he gives Moses these commands, you know, at least 10 of them called the Ten Commandments. And this is the law that you're going to live by. It's over 600 of these laws, but you're going to have to start living as if you are my people. And what the law did is it gave them a, a compass morally and also spiritually. It helped them deal with their sin and their, their separation from God. And they also learned how to live differently. Because the whole point of creating this nation was that they would be different than all the other nations of the world. They would be different in who they worshipped and how they worshipped and how they lived. And people would begin to take notice and they would go, what is so different about them? There's something that I like about these people. And they will go, it's because we worship the one true God. And you should too. And so they start living by the law. Sometimes well, sometimes not. They create this thing called the tabernacle, which is pretty much a tent in which heaven and earth meet and God and man are reconciled and, and can be in communion. And eventually they get to the edge of the promised land, 40 years into the wandering. And God says to Moses, hey man, tough job. I mean, we we'll deal with these people, tough job. You kind of messed up a little bit though. And so you and your entire generation, you don't get to go into the promised land. I'm going to let the next generation go. And so this man named Joshua takes over and he takes all the people into the promised land and he defeats all the inhabitants and begins to dwell there. One of the things that made them different than all the other nations as they were inhabiting the promised land was not only the laws that they have, but it was also their government structure. Is all the other nations, they had kings. And you know, you know what kings look like. I would imagine they're pretty similar back then as they, you know, crown and you got a whole uh, throne and you get to do what you want to do. But that's not how Israel operated. Because Israel was supposed to be God's people. And so he was going to wanted them to operate like it was supposed to be in the garden. Your king is God. And so for the first 300 years, that's how it operated was we don't have a king like all the other nations. We have God as our king and he dictates and he rules through his law. And then he sends these people called judges. When they started to get off track or when they find themselves in trouble, these judges would come along and they would speak and work on behalf of God to help the nation get back on track. But just as the story goes, because it's one giant cycle over and over again, what do the people do? Well, they do whatever they want to do, really. They eventually start to get away from God and his law. And they start to look at the judges and think, I'm not really sure they're, they're very useful. Actually, here's what, here's what they say. In those days, Israel had no king. Wait a minute. Hold on. I thought we had a king. No, they didn't think they had a king. Because God was supposed to be the king, but they weren't interested. And so everybody just did as they saw fit. No, we would never do this. This is not us. We wouldn't act like this. We don't do what we want to do when we want to do it. Uh, but this was their problem, is they just continued to live like they wanted to. And as things got worse, and it wasn't turning out the way that they wanted, they had to blame somebody. And so who did they blame? They blamed the judges. It's your guys' fault. You're the problem. And so they go to Samuel, who is the last judge of Israel, and they say to him, first of all, you're old, which is rude. That's rude. You're old. And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. See, the judges are the issue. It's not that we've rebelled against God. It's that we need a king like everybody else has. Because they started to live like all the other nations. And so we want a king like all the other people have a king. So God says, oh, you want a king? I'll give you a king. No problem. And so he sends the first king. His name is Saul. And he looks like a king. He's got it all together. I mean, he's your prince charming. And he even acts like a king in all of the worst ways. And they go, okay, yeah, that's not the kind of king we wanted. Can we have a different king? The guy goes, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a different king. There's this shepherd boy. He doesn't look like much, but he's going to be your next king. And you've heard of him before, David, David and Goliath. And that may be what you know him for. But David was actually the greatest king of Israel. Because not only was he a warrior, but he was also a man who loved God deeply. And so he brought the nation of Israel into a time of peace and prosperity. This was like the golden era. And people began to wonder, is this the guy? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? All the way back in Genesis, we promised, we promised a savior. Maybe David is the savior. That is until David started acting like, well, people act. Sinful. And so David 
as he's looking out over his vast kingdom from his palace, he sees a woman, and he says, she's quite attractive. I think I might have her. She might be my best friend's wife, but I'm the king. I can do what I want to do. And so he takes her, and he does what he wants to, and then he impregnates her, and he finds out that she's pregnant. And so what is he going to do? He's got to cover up this mess. And so he ends up killing one of his best friends in order to cover up what he's done. And he thinks he gets away with it. But you know who's watching? God. That's who's watching, right? God's watching and going, I can see you, dude. I see what you're doing. I can find, see what's happening here. And so God sends a messenger and he disciplines him. And David repents and he's forgiven, but he still has to experience the consequences of his decision. One of those is the loss of the child. The other is the division of his family. Is if you've never read the Bible before, um, Jerry Springer got his idea from the Old Testament. You should read about David's family. What a disaster. There are things that take place within this family that I am not comfortable discussing in church because it's wild. And so the consequences are felt throughout his entire family. But God makes a promise to David. And he says, David, you're not the Messiah very clearly. But what I am going to do is I'm going to send the Messiah and he's going to come through your family. Well, David dies and his son Solomon ends up taking over. As Solomon takes over, he, uh, he's granted one request from God. So God says, what, what do you want? What can I give you? His request is, I would like wisdom. I would like to be the wisest man on earth. God says, that's a really good request. I'm going to grant it to you. And he is. He even writes parts of the Bible. And we see this called wisdom literature that he writes chunks of. And the problem with him although he did some great things, he built the temple, is he's not only wise, but he also pursues women and wine. And those very quickly cloud his judgment and they pull him further and further away from God until God finally says, you know, this has been enough. And when Solomon dies, things really go bad. Israel starts to fall apart. There's a revolt in the kingdom and it ends up splitting into two pieces. In the north, you have Israel, but then in the south, you have Judah. And within about a hundred years, the nation of Israel is attacked by the Assyrians and they are taken away and they're never seen again, gone. Now you have the, the nation in the south, Judah, and they're still holding on and they have a series of kings. Some are good. Most of them are bad. Until one day, this other nation comes along, Babylon, with King Nebuchadnezzar, and he takes over, and he marches a big chunk of them, all the, all, all the successful people, into Babylon, into exile. And there's parts where you get to hear about this. You remember the story of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den? That takes place during this period. Well, because the world is so tumultuous, you have other nations that come. And so then the Persian armies, they come and they defeat the Babylonians. And so then you have them over Israel, and you have people like Esther, who becomes queen. And you also have people like Ezra who are allowed to go back to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild because they had this freedom of religion under the Persian rule. Or you have people like Nehemiah who are able to go back to Jerusalem and start to rebuild all that had been broken. And during this entire period, God sends messengers. They're called prophets. And they have different messages that they're delivering. Some of them, most of them are repent. You're screwing up and you need to get back on track. You need Jesus. Well, they don't know Jesus yet. You need God. You need to turn back because as you rebel, we've seen this story repeat over and over again. So turn back to God, he'll forgive you, and then you can bypass all the consequences. Others sent messages of hope. Hey, you're right in the middle of it right now. It's ugly and you can't see a way out. But just remember, God's faithful. He will fulfill his promises. And then there'll be others that would come and they would talk about this future Messiah. And they would give us even more details on who this Messiah will be and what he will look like and what we do. Some of those prophecies we actually read at Christmas, like in Isaiah. It says this, he says, for, us to, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. It's like this Messiah is still coming. I know he was promised so long ago, all the way back, but God continues to affirm and continues to elaborate. There will be a Messiah. He will come. And so the last prophet of Israel, Malachi, he comes along and here's what he says. 
He says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets and every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Look, my name will be known and it's gonna be through you and your people. And so that promise is going to come true, but here's what you're gonna have to do. This is one of the last things that God says to the people of Israel. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him. What he's saying is, be faithful. Be faithful, because I'm going to be faithful. And so just continue to hold on. And then you know what happens after God delivers this message? He goes silent. For 400 years, nothing. Not another prophet, not another miraculous event. In fact, things continue to get worse for Israel. Another nation comes and attacks and defeats them, and then another one after that, and they pretty much are close to being eliminated off the face of the earth. Now, I got to imagine, during this period of time, being a first century Jewish person, and looking back on the last 400 years and thinking, so you made these promises to Abraham, right? One of the promises was that we would be a great nation. I don't feel like we're a great nation. All we've been is a nation under the rule of all these other foreign nations. And curse those who curse us? Hello? <laughs> that has not happened. In fact, we seem to be the ones that are cursed. And you're going to bless the world through us? We can't even bless ourselves. And so I got to be honest, I'm having a really difficult time holding on and continuing to believe. It's feeling less and less like a promise and more and more like a fairy tale. Because I want to hold on. I want to I wanna continue to be faithful, but you're not showing up and you're not doing anything. Have you ever felt that way before? Or, or you've prayed? And maybe it's like an earnest prayer. Like you really need God to show up and you're asking for something significant, life altering, and it's good. And yet God seems to be completely silent and doing nothing. What do you do in those moments? Well, if you're in the first century, one of your options is you just give up. You go, look, I don't know what that was all about, but it ain't working anymore. So I'm just going to live like everybody else lives. I'm going to go do me and we'll just forget all this God promises stuff. Here, here's the issue though, is everybody is promising you something. And so when you walk away from God's promises, you're going to walk to someone or something else and their promises. So the world promises us lots of things. It says, if you pursue money and sex and partying and play, if you pursue those things, you're going to be satisfied. That's a, that's a promise. And so the question then becomes um, not who's making a promise, but which promise is actually going to come true? <laughs> which one's actually going to fulfill? Which one's going to satisfy? Is it going to be God's promise or is it going to be what the world has to offer? So some people said, you know, we're going to continue to believe that God is going to fulfill his promises. And we look at the past as evidence. As we look at all the things that he's done in order to get us, even in this place where we don't want to be, the fact that we exist is evidence that God is working. And so I'm going to continue to trust my future with him because of what he's done in the past. There's no way he brought us all the way here and is just going to abandon us now. One of those people was a man named Saul. He was a religious leader at the time, later would become Paul. And he was faithfully waiting for God to show up, even during this silence. And he writes a letter. It's in Galatians. And he's reflecting on the silence. And then when God finally broke the silence, and he says this, he says, but when the right time came. Now, <laughs> imagine talking to a first century Jew going, no, no, God's waiting for the right time in order to go, the right time? It's been 400 years, dude. We've been attacked, we've been defeated, we've been ruled over. I mean, any time would be the right time. I could have picked about a thousand times that were the right time. But he says, no, 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 no. God's waiting for just the right time. Here's the issue. Is you and I, our life is just a blink of an eye. And so when we're looking at the picture, we just see this tiny little segment of the piece of the puzzle. But as God, from his perspective, looks at it, it says he sees the beginning from the end. He sees how this whole thing is coming together. And so from his perspective, he's waiting for the right time. They would have never known it in the moment. But we have some insight now that God actually was playing the right time. Because you remember one of the nations I said was, uh, that took them over was uh, the Greeks? Well, the Greeks, even though they ruled over them and it was not fun or friendly, they brought this thing called uh, common language 
where now people who spoke native dialects throughout the empire, they now spoke one common tongue and they could communicate with people all over. And then the Roman Empire came along and because of their government and the size of their government, they were able to unite everybody under one government and they were able to control everyone. And they actually brought a time of peace and prosperity. And because the people weren't fighting wars and fighting against other nations, they were underneath this, the Roman Empire, they were able to build things like roads and ports. They were able to travel to places they've never been and speak languages now to one another. And as Israel was experiencing just one tragedy after another, and they realized we're not going to be able to fix this, because they tried. Some of the history is they had these revolts, and they would try to revolt against Rome, and it, and it never worked. And so by the first century, they're going, we have one hope. It's if the Messiah comes. And so there's this religious hunger that's going on. People are looking for the Messiah. And it's in this moment where all of this is taking place that God goes, that's the right time. And he does this. He sent his son. Nobody saw this coming. Everybody was looking for a political figure or maybe some kind of warrior who would come and defeat the enemies. Nobody thought that God is going to send his son, that he's going to step into creation and fulfill the promises that he made. And the timing, as we get to look back now, and you would have never been able to see it then, it was this tiny window in human history before the population explosion that we see today around the world, during the time when they could communicate and the message could spread, and they had the, during just this tiny window in human history, God sends his son. And as you're sitting there as a first century Jew, you're thinking, God, what are you doing? You've gone silent. You've abandoned us. God's going, oh, just wait. I've got the perfect plan, and I'm waiting for just the right time. So for me, when I read the Old Testament and I get to see the big picture of it and I see how it all comes together and I would have never been able to guess it, I would never have been able to plan it, but I get to reflect on it now and I find myself in the middle of whatever mess I'm in that seems so big and it feels like it's too late for God to do anything about it or I can't see a way out, I can't see how God is going to fix this, it feels like God's distant and inattentive, maybe he's gone, maybe he never even existed. I can reflect on this and go, you know, he's faithful then. Why wouldn't he be faithful now? It, is, it may not make sense to me from my perspective. It may be really confusing, and I can't see how this puzzle is coming together. But I can trust him. I can trust his plan, and I can trust his timing. And so that's the season that you're in. Maybe that's the message that you need to hear, is God can be trusted. He's faithful in his promises. The only question is not, will he do what he promised? Will he be faithful? The question is, will you be faithful? That in the middle of it, when it doesn't make any sense and you just can't see a way forward, you go, God, I still trust you. Let's pray. Lord God, your plan is full of so many twists and turns. There's no way that we could guess. There's no way that we could figure it out ahead of time. We just look back and we go, Wow. I never would have seen that coming. And yet one of the things that is amazing is it's always better than whatever we could have imagined. It, it, we could have never imagined that not only would you fulfill your promises, but you would do so in such an extraordinary way. And so Lord God, we, in the middle of our messes, where we're asking where you're at, I just pray that this would give us hope that we would be able to reflect on the fact that you are a good God and that you fulfill your promises and so that we can trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, will you guys stand with me? On your way out, there are some questions if you want to discuss with your friends or your family this week. And uh, make sure you're here next week because we begin the New Testament. We'll see you then. God bless.